doing my research, I realized that these constellations and these tarot cards were intimately connected. And I could not understand how and why. So in understanding how and why tarot and astrology are deeply connected will be the subject of these videos over the next coming weeks. The first stop is the Aries Emperor archetype. And this is how we discover how to overcome our challenges. This is how we discover our internal hero. And this is how we discover the energy within that allows us to overcome all challenges because we all realize that we have challenges, but then we don't understand the right mindset to have in dealing with our challenges. So if we want to fully understand how to overcome whatever issues we're faced with, we can find it in dealing with the Aries slash Emperor archetype. Let's first start with archetypes. An archetype is from the Greek word archetypon, which means the first molded. Now, from the Greek, this leads us to the psychologist Carl Jung that claimed that within us all, we have a fixed number of models that we all can share and we haven't necessarily been taught them. When you were in school and the leader and the clown and the damsel in distress and the magician, none of these things were particularly taught. We just seem to really thrive in those particular roles and the roles that we have in society that we thrive that aren't taught are known to be archetypes. But the thing about archetypes is just because we haven't been taught does not mean that we cannot be taught them. The idea is to fully understand the constellations and the astrology as a whole, because within each astrological sign, there is a gift. And with each gift we could utilize as human beings, we don't have to be fixated on a particular constellation based upon the inundation of conversations surrounding the subject of astrology. Oh, you're an Aries. Oh, you're a Taurus. Oh, you're a that. Oh, you're a this. And if I'm a this or a that, then I can't do this and that because that's not what Aries do. Well, we're not conversating on that level. We're talking about our primal instincts that are found in the concept of archetypes. Now, Throughout these videos, we'll be explaining a lot of information that has been there, but hasn't been brought to the surface. So allow this information to be brought to the surface. The constellation Aries is Latin for Ram, and it is the first astrological sign, which is interesting because as we know, within a circle, there is no beginning, there is no end. So why did the ancient people look at Aries as the first astrological sign? Aries is also a fire sign, indicating enthusiasm, expression, and a trust in your spiritual journey. There has to be faith in your movement. There has to be enthusiasm, a realization that God is within you. Enthusiasm is taken from the Greek word entheos, which simply means that God is within you. So realizing that God is within you is the primary first sign that one needs to begin this spiritual journey and to express this truth, express this connection from the soul, from the depths and, and, and be able to verbalize it or symbolize it through your art is the first step to understanding it. And this is why they say that Aries is the first astrological sign. Aries is a cardinal sign, which means it's not much waving or maneuverability to it. There's not much mutual understanding. It is the way that it wants to be. It is our force of action. It is our force of initiative. What I mean is so if you are down bad, and you take the initiative to better your life, you would never expect or even tolerate or accept <laughs> a person saying, hey, you shouldn't be better in your life right now. You should really be dumbing your shit down. So the planet that rules Aries is Mars. And the interesting thing about Mars, when you flip it backwards, you get R-A-M, which is Ram. And Aries just simply means Ram in Latin. Mars is the Roman name for Aries, not to be confused with the constellation Aries, A-R-I-E-S, but the Roman deity 
A-R-E-S, which is the Greek god of war. Now, although they have different mythologies, they all speak to the same energy. And this is the archetypal image of the warrior, leader, hero, or emperor. The emperor <laughs> is the fifth card in the deck, but although it's marked by the number four, this card symbolizes leadership, responsibility, self-control, discipline, and focus. The emperor has an outward mode. Tarot cards have different modes, mainly outward and inward. The emperor's outward mode is representing through activating, initiating, creating, expressing, showing you something that you've never seen before, going into new worlds, expressing yourself, creating new things, initiating new things, activating things. This is all emperor energy. This is all Aries energy. And this is all archetypal energy that we have within that's easily activated if we understand how. So let's talk about how. In understanding archetypes, we understand that this one is representing our internal hero. It is representing our ability to initiate things. So within this energy, this allows us to overcome challenges. And the reason or the way how we activate it is through courage. When it comes to our life, whether it comes to starting a new web page, starting a new business, starting a new relationship, going to a new gym, or doing the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's new or old. The, the mere fact that we're initiating something in our life is our greatest gift. Now understand that like whatever you want to create in this life has to be initiated. And without that, we would just simply be slaves to a particular energy that rules over us. And this is an emperor. So the Aries emperor archetype could be externalized or it could be internalized. So back to how we activate this energy, we activate it through courage. Now, courage comes from the root word core, which means heart, center, or core. So our heart, our center, our core is our courage, our ability to operate from our heart, the ability to operate from our center, the ability to operate from our core. So this is the primary archetype. So the main thing about this archetype is how it looks at challenges, because we all realize that we have challenges. Well, the Aries Emperor archetype sees life as a challenge that it can ultimately overcome. It doesn't look at it like, oh, my God, I got to go through these challenges. No, it looks at it like, yes, another challenge. Let's knock it out. You understand? Let's take over. Let's be in charge. And so if we look at our challenges and we look at look at them as defeating principles, then we'll never initiate or even try to fight against it. But if we look at it as positive ways to manifest positive things in our lives, then we'll look at our challenges gleefully and joyfully. OK, so like Aries, the emperor reminds us that anything worth having for real is worth fighting for. Now, a lot of things in our life, we feel like we don't have to fight for them and things of that nature. But when it comes to something that you truly want, something that you truly desire, then this is all related to that Aries emperor. Whenever we utilize courage and so we can understand how much of this Aries emperor archetype is activated within us based upon our ability to deal with our challenges. OK, are we happy to deal with them or are we sad to finish this off, to bring this connection? As we said, Aries is Latin for Ram. But within history, there is something that is big that is called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is the the hippocampus is involved in formation of new memories. All right. It is the way that we initiate new memories and it is associated with learning and emotion. The hippocampus is also called Ammon's horn. Now, the Greek form of the name was Ammon and the Libyan Jupiter, whom the Greeks identified with is Zeus. So Aries representation as a ram is identified with the Egyptian god Ammon. So we have a deity called Ammon Zeus. So Zeus Ammon is actually the ram. It is actually Aries, but it's actually a part of our temple lobe as well. So if we didn't have this function in our brain, these connections would have never been established. In order to explain these connections, 
we are understanding how we could talk to God. Quite simply, Ammon from Egypt is the hidden one. He is the king of the gods. He is the Lord of thrones of the visible and invisible worlds. Now, another word, another word for that would be emperor. Ammon is the, the creator God who is the mysterious soul of the universe that reveals itself in light. Ammon is the light creator, builder and grand architect of the house and temple and body. And this is the hippocampus. OK, the hippocampus creates our reality by giving us new memories, by dealing with our learning and our emotions. So in understanding this to really su summarize this Aries, the emperor as an archetype is found in your hippocampus, your ability to create new memories, to learn new things and to process your emotions. When we have challenges and we have difficulties, we could deal with this part of the human body, which is connected to the celestials found in the constellation Aries. But we could also utilize the lessons of the emperor tarot card. Maybe it's time to be more disciplined. Maybe it's time to be more focused. Maybe it's time to utilize more self-control utilize a leadership role, be more responsible when it comes to our lives. All of these things help us understand ourselves and figuring out who we are as we deal with the archetypes and astrology, Aries and the Emperor. Go ahead and slap a like on this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notifications bell and share this because you don't know who can help. Taurus is related to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a powerful gland that is connected to the hormone thyroxine. It's very important in childbirth and overall emotional and mental health. And it's also related to how we speak, the things that we say to the world and also the things that we say to ourselves. Archetypes from the Greek word archetypon are meant as first molded. Carl Jung claimed that there are a fixed numbers of models that we all share without having been taught them. So that is to say the singers, dancers, actors and athletes who are elite, they haven't necessarily been taught that elite status. It was something that was in their DNA. And so within our DNA, our inner clues or archetypes as to how we can grow into our own self-realization. Taurus is how we can speak things into existence. Taurus represents the physical world, but it also rules the throat. So if you connect the throat to the physical world, it's, it's simply saying it's how we speak things into existence. This is a fixed sign as well. So it teaches us how to persevere and how to also be productive. Hathor symbolizes the entire heavens. Another word for this is Pleiades. And this includes our sun, moon, and all of the stars. She is depicted as a cow, which is the symbol of how we nurture life and extension. It represents civilization as a whole. Hathor is our celestial cow and she represents Taurus. Now, Venus is just a Roman word for a Greek word that's called Aphrodite. Aphrodite is just a Greek word for the Egyptian word Hathor. So to summarize what I just said, Venus simply means Hathor. Hathor is the ruler of Taurus. Venus is the ruler of Taurus. It is the archetypal image of the builder, the nature lover, the musician, the provider, the farmer or the dancer. Now, all of these things because we can have a multitude of different ways that we can live our lives and still utilize the same archetype. It just represents our ability to harness, use and sustain our primal energy. So we can just use musician and dancer as an example of what do we do that's elite that nobody can do as good as we can, even if they were taught, even if they were trained they still couldn't do it because we weren't taught this. We weren't trained in this fashion. This is our primal energy. Now, the Hierophant 
is a symbol for human beings just wanting to live a better life. People go to church, people adapt religious ideologies at the core because they simply want to live a better life. They want to know more. They want to understand what are we here for? And so a lot of people go to church. Billions of people do some form of spiritual practice. So that's not a coincidence. This represents the Hierophant. But where people mess up is that they think that the Hierophant is an external realization. But the real Hierophant is within and it is the thyroid gland. So Taurus Hierophant, Taurus rose the throat. The Hierophant is the spiritual leader or the spiritual guru. And it doesn't represent somebody external. It represents the internal. But since we don't utilize our particular thyroid functions, the priest or the pope or the reverend or the imam just takes the place. So we have an inner guide that we could provide ourselves with practical spiritual structuring of our lives. We can create our own rituals. We can speak life into ourselves. We can speak things into existence. And this is our birthright at the end of the day. So a lot of people don't utilize it. Some people do, but the people who do, they are utilizing their hierophant within. They're utilizing their ability to speak life in themselves, whether they are wealthy, they're saying that to themselves. They are poor, they're saying it to themselves. It's inner dialogue. And this is combined with the subsequent action. And that subsequent action is tied into our other video where we were referencing Aries in the form of initiation through challenges. So in summary, this archetype is related to our connection to our spiritual birthright. Our spiritual birthright is the ability to speak things into existence. <laughs> the modality to which we speak things into existence. The reason why I'm talking to you right now is a result of my thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a small butterfly shaped gland that's located directly below the larynx or the voice box. So the thyroid is the gland that controls communication. It is the center point between the head and the heart. The thyroid problems happen when we don't release the hormones called thyroxine and these hormones are released because we might not have the wherewithal to speak up for oneself. We might not have the wherewithal to, you know, speak our truth. We are simply repeating the negative things to ourselves. And this is the inner self talk. This is very important because the same things that you can say to yourself that make you cry are the same things you can say to yourself that can build you up and to take you to levels that you never once imagined. And this is all tied into the power of Hathor. Hathor is depicted as a celestial cow with cosmos, stars, planets in her dress with the globe inside of her horn. Hathor is the goddess of song and dance. The ancient Egyptians believed that it was she who taught humans how to sing and dance. So Hathor is represented with horns, with the sun between her horns, which is Amon-Ra, which is Aries in the last video we talked about, which is the solar force, which is just simply in endocrinology, our thyroid connecting to our pituitary master glands and utilizing the ability to create as we speak and ultimately working with our hippocampus and creating our present reality as we see it. And this is representing the cosmos. This is this is relating our feminine forces and understanding our feminine forces and the secretion and the release of proper hormones is found in endocrinology. And the ancients studied the glands and how they related to the planets and the stars. So this is how I'm connecting Taurus to the thyroid gland to the goddess Hathor and how we utilize the thyroid gland to speak unto ourselves divinity and sovereignty because astrology is the practice of becoming sovereign and how we become sovereign is speak sovereignty unto ourselves now proper function of the thyroid is key to our mental and emotional balance when we have extreme stress 
This can result in thyroid dysfunction. Today we're talking about the archetype of the inner child and the twin soul, which is synonymous with the sign Gemini and the tarot card, the lovers. And putting them together, it forms the archetype of the inner child. And I'm going to explain why. So in archetypes, we're relating the celestial concepts to the mortal concepts. And no other constellation identifies this more so than Gemini, which is Latin for twins, which could be confusing. If you don't have a twin, you might think that it doesn't apply to you. But the reality is that it applies to everyone because the twin that they're referencing is the twin that is the soul. And so Gemini is an air sign. So it's about having a mental idea of how this thing works. So one would say, how do I do inner child work? How do I actually do it? Well, in reference to Gemini, you have to have a mental idea or awareness or a cognizance of the thoughts that you have. Gemini is also a mutable sign, which means it's adaptable. So when you reference the trickster or you reference the messenger, it's about being mutable. It's about being changeable because these individuals show up differently depending on the circumstances. Another way that we connect this to the inner child is because Gemini is connected to the thymus gland. It rules over the thymus gland. Thymus. The thymus is a bilobed lymphoid organ situated in the superior mediastinum. It is usually prominent in children and gradually increases in size till puberty, when it weighs about 40 grams. Thereafter, it atrophies and gets infiltrated by fibrous and fatty tissue. Now, the thymus gland is a mysterious gland and is inactive in most adults but it is active and vibrant up until adolescence. From childbirth to adolescence, it grows and then it reaches a certain point where it stops. And so this represents our inner child. This represents our twin soul archetype. In other words, it represents the innocence within adults that's literally shut off. It literally is not activated. So when they say activate your heart chakra, or when they say heal your inner child, it's more or less of activating these hormones that this actual gland secretes, but no longer secretes in adults. But let me digress and talk about the lovers, which is associated with Gemini. So lovers or to love is a mental concept of understanding. This mental level implies having an intelligent grasp on the mechanics of consciousness is one thing to love, but to be a lover is an actual action that you have to have a mind to it. It's not a easy, simple thing to love and to know how to love. And so when we're separated from our soul and we don't understand that we have a soul or we don't or we have a twin, then this creates confusion about life because we, we don't understand our larger part. So the quest or the journey is about finding yourself. Now, the irony or the trick, right? Like the tricks there is that what we're looking for external is really internal. And this creates a greater understanding and learning the mental aspects of how to activate your heart and heal your inner child. And this alleviates that initial confusion that we're born with when we don't know that our soul is active and our soul is actually a twin. So this connection between the lovers, between ourselves and our soul represents the divine connecting with the mundane and once was viewed as opposites or react are actually one in the same, which our souls and ourselves are twins. So Combining the Gemini and the lovers as an archetype, it really shows us our inner child and then how we activate our inner child, how we heal our inner child. How do you do this? We have to learn the art of storytelling, decoding messages, remaining youthful, staying interested or being interesting and also having a sense of humor. This is what this archetype is about. So, and these are the different ways that we can heal our inner child. 
Now I could do a whole video for hours and hours about how to heal the inner child. But the reality is that we all have different inner childs that need to be healed. So the best thing that I could do is talk about how to heal your heart chakra, how to balance your heart chakra and how to balance it is to establish unconditional love. And from that unconditional love, you follow your heart and you don't take things too hard because uh, taking things too hard is actually triggering the fear and shutting down that inner child because it's so afraid of results. And so to bring this into further context, Gemini is based on the mythology of Castor and Pollux. Castor was immortal and Pollux was immortal. When Castor died on the battlefield, Zeus was moved by Pollux's love for his brother. So Zeus agreed to keep them together. So they existed in the heavens as Gemini. And then the other half of the time they existed in the, uh, in the underworld or earth. So this actual star system, which is Gemini, is telling a larger story about human life. And they say that Gemini rules the nervous, respiratory, shoulders, arms, legs, hands, fingers, and also the thymus gland. Now the thymus gland from birth produces T cells to fight illness. During adulthood, it stops producing T cells and goes into atrophy. And after it stops working around the age of 50, it just stops producing T cells. So whatever T cells we have, that's what we need to combat illness. So this is why older people get sicker than younger people generally is because of the thymus gland active in fighting off diseases and illnesses. And then when you get older, it's not so strong, but we can activate our thymus gland in adulthood. We just have to know how. And the way that we activate it is through unconditional love and activating the heart chakra. So let's just explain a little bit further what happens with the inner child biologically. So from infancy up to our 14th year, the bread marrow in our bones make all of the blood and most of them are supplied by the thymus gland, which is the largest in the fetus. And this is coming from our mom. So the blood that pumps through our body is made from the thymus gland, which is a maternal thing. But as we grow older, our pituitary system creates our blood and our thymus gland does not. So as it were, when we get a little bit older, we start to make our own blood and we no longer need the thymus gland. And so from that point, we really deal with the ego. We deal with ourselves. But what are we losing? We're losing that sense of connection to the family. And so it's a real balance that needs to take place within us based upon rites of passage and things of that nature that most Western society children don't experience or know much about. So the main part that we want to kind of focus on is really understanding how to activate this. And one of the ways to actually beat on your chest lightly when you wake up and hum something sort of like what they did on the Wolf of Wall Street when they were explaining how to make money was when they were beating on their chest and humming where it is a movie thing. But the real science is that they're activating their thymus, they're activating their God level, they're activating our, their soul and their ability to fight off or protect them from radiation and radiation can hit affect you in many different ways. But ultimately viewing this from a psychological aspect is that this actual gland is awakening in humanity as a whole. And for the individual, it's time for us to activate this archetype and awaken the inner child and become aware of his existence because this is a superpower. This is the awakening of our soul. Even more so, if you look up thymos in the Greek language, it literally means soul. So connecting the thymos to Gemini is connecting the soul to the human being 
and understanding that that is your twin that is everyone's twins and if we all awoken to this understanding this this mental understanding within itself could heal the world uh exponentially and so in our most simplest way we're trying to connect the cancer and the chariot archetype to the human body and figure out how this relates to us and so in my most simplest way i'm going to attempt to connect the cancer the crab to our digestive system and how it's more net, more or less connected to our ability to rebirth and transform our lives so cancer is latin for crab cancer is ruled by the moon and the crab is known to be on the ocean and kind of sits on the waves or moves to and fro with the tide of the ocean and so that tide of the ocean is ruled by the moon so the constellation of cancer being ruled by the moon utilizes a crab as its symbol so even more so it wasn't just the crab that represented cancer the egyptians represented cancer as a scarab or a dung beetle now the beetle is clearly linked to the moon's 28 day cycle because of how it deposits this ball of eggs rolls it into a dung of earth and for the space of 28 days it creates a baby so this is an understanding of creation and utilizing the moon when you think of cancer you think of wealth but even more so when you connect it to our human body wealth is a symbol of health and health is the way that we reproduce and ultimately grow another reason that cancer is connected to a crab is because when a crab grows it has to shed its shell and when we want to grow and we want to reach the next level up we have to detoxify our body we have to purify our body if we really want to grow and we really have to re-energize or revitalize the solar plexus chakra which is ruled by cancer we're dealing with the stomach digestive organs breasts ovaries and womb so the stomach and digestive organs allow us to take nourishment it allows us to grow the breast ovaries and womb when we suckled the breast as children we were conceived through the ovaries and the womb and allowed us to grow so these are the cellular nutrition and reproductive energies within the human body that cancer rules over which is another way of saying our wealth so moving forward the chariot represents a man who is holding something in his stomach region but above him is a crab and then the words is got to look really close but they say abracadabra meaning that our words change our reality meaning that our internal creates our external and another way to explain this card he's in a chariot and the chariot is moving forward so if we can move this energy internally gonna naturally move externally and that's basically what this card is saying being ruled by cancer is as above so below you have the six on top and the nine on bottom and this represents a connection of some sort and this connection is found in the digestive system if we have a purified free flowing digestive system then our life is the same way and a lot of our trauma a lot of our sadness a lot of stress is found in the lower regions and so once we clear that out life is never the same once we detoxify the body then we're dealing with the level of rebirth which is a level of dying to the old self so the true self can live now the key symbolism found in this card is the idea of moving forward so like food moving through the digestive system when we are internally moving forward so is our external life if we are backed up misdirected or blocked internally then the same follows for our life now combining cancer and the chariot archetype together this represents our healer within or our motherly archetype when we say the mother archetype one could be confused and think about their own personal mother whether she was a good mom or a bad mom but we're not talking about that type of mother we're talking about the esoteric mother which is our our stomach digestive tract the breast the ovaries and the womb these are the energies that protect heal and nourish and allow us to establish ourselves no matter how deep you get no matter how profound you get you still need the practical nourishment from the cellular body 
and from this allows you to get as deep as you want to get but unless you have this understanding of purification and the traveling of the blood flow and the food flow for that matter then one deals with the level of block because the stomach is the seat of the soul for real when we're out of touch with this archetype we're out of touch with this modality to heal like the scarab beetle we have the ability to self-generate ourselves on a 28-day celestial cycle one of the main ways as humans we can regenerate ourselves is through purifying the body so dealing with this further the cancer chariot as an archetype represents our motherly healing aspects whether it's breast milk breaking down food or hydrating the cells and this allows humans to reproduce and live so quite simply a river runs through you cancer is a water sign so this is the first water sign and we're really dealing with our internal river the egyptians dealt with the nile river a lot and one could think that they're actually talking about the river now but what if they're talking about the digestive tract and commit the black land is just the black body what if and so understanding that a river runs through you is rich and hugely varied and has a ecosystem that has over a thousand different species a hundred trillion organisms and that's 10 times more microorganisms than the cells in your whole entire body and this whole ecosystem is your digestive tract so you have a whole system and a whole life within you that you might not even understand and this represents our ability to rebirth ourselves moving forward rebirth is a central theme of crab and the scarab beetle which we saw reflected in its repeated actions and self-regenerating habits and this is the fact of reincarnation and reoccurring existence in the ancient egyptians they referred to this entire digestive system as the river of life or the river of death depending on what you float down it now cleaning this canal is one of the most profound things you can do for your health and understanding that health and wealth are practically synonymous and then you understand that cancer has a lot to do with wealth so emotional digestion research shows that inflammation a typical immune response to obesity may be the precursor to mood disorders such as depression when people clean up their diet inflammation is reduced and the moods improve a large percentage of your serotonin levels which is produced in your gut is the digestive system responsible for the absorption of nutrients lymphatic functions and our overall immune system so when any of these functions are off our whole system is out of whack so is our life so it's key to identify remove any toxins that might be upset in your digestive system finally the digestive system is also linked to a large energy center known as the solar plexus chakra this is the energy center that holds how worthy we feel how we are seen in this world our self-esteem our feelings of personal power and how we're actually digesting life so in surmise to get to this level of healing the solar plexus we have to get to a level of purifying the digestive tract making sure that all of our energy is moving forward within so our life can move forward externally and this is all related to water and cancer being a water sign and understanding our digestive systems is really clearly linked to this archetype and then another thing before i get out is dealing with cellular hydration making sure your water has enough alkaline levels that actually hydrate your cell as opposed to drinking soda and all of these different things which probably isn't nothing wrong with it as long as you're hydrating your cellular body so um, just to give you a quick review today we talked about cancer how it's connected to the digestive system which is linked to rebirth and forward moving. And this ties into as above, so below, as within, so without. These are universal laws. Aries deals with the Ammon's horns, the hippocampus, which allows us to be present and have human initiative. 
Taurus is the thyroid, which allows us to speak in our words, creating matter. Gemini is connected to the thymus gland, which is asleep for most adults. And this represents our inner child, our twin soul, our twin flame within. Today, we're talking about how we can master our external life by mastering our internal life and raising our Kundalini. And this is found in the archetype of Leo in the Lust card. Well, if you study the Rider Weight deck, it would be the Strength card. But if you study the Thoth Tarot deck, it would be Lust. So understanding these, both of these energies com combined represent the energy of raising your Kundalini. And I'm going to explain why. Leo is a constellation, but Leo is Latin for lion. And Leo is the fifth astrological sign. Leo is a fire sign. Fire sign indicates Kundalini. It indicates our inner chi, our inner ki, or our inner G. This is fire ultimately, it is our human essence. And this is a fixed sign as well. So this is a stabilizing energy of the initial cardinal energy preceding it, which is Cancer. And so Cancer and Leo share a lot of similarities. One of the main similarities is shedding the skin. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But Leo is ruled by the sun and the sun represents the self, the admin, the real self that goes beyond the ego or the false self. The false self or the ego is the person that we look into in the mirror or we think that's looking back onto us. But the real true self, Atman, is deep within us. And the sun is symbolic for that life force. Another symbol for this life force is the Ankh. Here on this picture, we see Isis and Neftis flanking this energy. So Isis and Neftis represent the feminine energy, divine mother or Shakti energy that's allowing this energy to raise through the Dejed pillar, which represents the spine and the Ankh is the thoracic spine, the spine that controls our rib cage and our rib cage protects our lungs and our heart. So the Ankh or the thoracic spine is a very important point to protection and ultimate spiritual development. Leo rules the thoracic spine and this enables us to stand tall, proud and upright. It doesn't get that much press, but the reality is that it is a important thing because it protects our most vital organs, mainly our heart and our lungs. Now let's deal with the tarot card, lust or strength. Lust is in the rider weight. Lust is defined in the Thoth Tarot deck. Strength, however, is the rider weight deck. But both of these cards ultimately represent the same energy and how they represent the same energy is through the Hebrew letter Teth. And this connects the card lust to the constellation Leo. Now Teth means serpent and it has dual roles. There's the lower serpent that's centered on sex and earthly things. And then there's the higher serpent that's centered on raising the Kundalini. Now the serpent within itself represents that coiled up spinal energy that stimulates the sex nerves. The serpent represents the coiled up energy at the base of the spine and raising up this energy is raising up the serpent, AKA the Kundalini. The serpent is a symbol for renewal and growth, shedding its skin, like I said earlier. And this archetype is the understanding of the Leo lust connection. When we merge with the ecstasy of our spirit, because our spirit represents a sexual energy that's a little weird at the base energy, but as we raise it up, it becomes supremely divine. It becomes supremely our understanding and our connection to the divine mother and kundalini isn't just the buzzword it is an energy that raises up our intelligence our psychic abilities so forth and so on so this archetype within itself the lust leo archetype represents our creative power our inner key energy or inner chi so this humanity that we're living in is blocking this stuff off but once we open it up we have the expression of inward spiritual generosity. That means giving ourselves the proper energy that we need to raise ourselves up. And another way that we raise ourselves up is through the spine. Even more so, the symbol of Leo represents the lion's head. And then that line represents the lion's spine and its heart. So the 
the the theme of the back and the back energy is synonymous with the energy of leo you just have to look you just have to look close enough when we learn to transform these forces the prana all of our energy that we have been suppressing are is allowed to wake up is allowed to rise through our spinal column so this awakens our courage of the lion the the ferocity of the lion is representing the fire that rises up our spine and so you got to be ready for this you got to be prepared for this you have to want it and and there is no trick there is no secret technique there is no reader there is no guru there is no amount of money that you can pay to raise your kundalini you have to sit and understand that this is something that you want that you are a spiritual being having a human experience because if you view this as a human then you don't think of yourself as having an internal life and so this is what the astrology plays out it plays out the reality of an internal life and the reality is enlightened by the raising of kundalini so the ankh and raising kundalini the ankh symbol today represents life after death and eternity the ankh is an ancient egyptian hieroglyph that represents life and it also signifies the breath of life it resembles the thoracic vertebrae however and when you cut the thoracic vertebrae in half and you look at it from a from a 2d flat perspective it looks extremely like an ankh so understanding that the ankh is a symbol of ascension and kundalini's energetic pathway that the energy has to rise up through this column of the spine and once it actually reaches the top then we have an illumination and this is what the symbol of the ankh represents so connecting the ankh to leo to the lust card we understand that there is a tremendous importance of ruling the spine and the heart and this has a direct bearing on the development of our soul understanding a lot of people rock ankhs as earrings chains if you look at the egyptian hieroglyphs of the gods and goddesses they all held ankhs but what does it truly mean to me it really means the development of our soul and it also represents the realization of the divine mother and through the raising of the shakti energy through our spines this is how we really become awoke and there's nothing that we can buy there's nothing that we can do there's nothing that we can say or show that our kundalini is raised except actually doing the work be sure to utilize the links in the description to check the article out for this video that we're having here today we're talking about the archetype of virgo and the hermit most people don't really study archetypes most people think they're just out here doing it by themselves but when you study archetypes you'll realize that within the human body there are actually power centers or glands or understandings about the human body that actually grow you into self-realization and a lot of people deal with the external world and what they can get out of the external world but a lot of people do not deal with the internal world so this conversation is centered on the internal world in this conversation we'll be talking about virgo we'll be talking about the hermit we'll be talking about the virgo and hermit archetype as well as the spleen and our higher consciousness and how this all relates so give me a second as we kind of go through this but like i said earlier if you want to read through this be sure to click the links in the description the constellation virgo is latin for virgin it is the sixth astrological sign virgo has a fixed earth mode of expression so what that means is mutable it's changeable but it's actually earth and earth relates to the physical world but more importantly the physical world as we understand it is just simply the human body so another word for this process is constant change and constant change is another word for alchemy virgo is ruled by mercury which represents alchemy because if you understand mercury as an element it extracts gold from rock when mercury comes into contact with gold the gold dissolves into the mercury and when the two is separated the mercury can be distilled off and all that's left is gold and so this is the process of psychological alchemy in just the real sense of how they can transfer the element mercury to the planet mercury and then ultimately to human psychological processes so if you want to check out psychological alchemy i did a whole series on that the link to that will be in the descriptions like i said virgo is an earth sign and this is denoted as being melancholic and melancholic in old medicine is defined as black bile
bio. Black bio is a mental depression. In old medicine, they imagined that there was black bile that was secreted from the spleen and it would have you sad or disorientated, just not with it. One had to understand that Virgo governs the abdomen, including the spleen, all of the organs, the belly, the bowels, the small intestine. So this is the human body. And if you understand the spleen, which we'll talk about a little later, it is our ability to purify ourselves of this melancholy, of this neg of these negative energies. So understanding when they say Virgo is the sign of purity is not like a moral purity. It's an actual physical purity that the spleen takes care of. So that's why Virgo rules over the spleen. It's a, it's a symbol of the human body. The hermit is associated with Virgo as well. And this is closely related to the body, health, personal development. Mercury rules Virgo. Here we have another form of alchemy and we have another understanding of the creativity and maturity that happens within the human body. And this is showing us our ability to be more than just one thing. We have earth, we have air. And that's why in mythology, Mercury is the mediator between the living and the dead because he is seen as an air sign, but he's also seen as an earth sign. And this is just a, another understanding of Mercury as an element because it's known as Quicksilver. It could be a metal and it could also be liquid. So it's just the malleability of the human mind and the human body. So the symbol for the hermit, the symbol for Virgo and how it connects is through the Hebrew letter Yad. Yad represents the building blocks to creation. And if we understand the building blocks to creation is representative of higher consciousness. So what do I mean? A sperm is a symbol of Yah. Now we can't tell our sperm, hey, we want you to make this baby and we want it to be like this, like that, like that, like this. No, it does it automatically. So when they use sperm as a symbol, it represents God in a sense and how we are God within ourselves because we have the ability to have children, but we don't actually know how that works. Okay. We, we might understand how it works, but we can't manipulate the process. We just kind of have to do what we need to do and then let nature take its course. So the actual modality of nature taking its course is the, is encapsulated in the symbol of the yard, the hermit or Virgo. Let's deal with the spleen. Magic window. What? What is this? What's Don't going worry on? about it. Check this out. The spleen's that soft purple organ located right behind the stomach and under the lungs. It's about five inches wide and weighs about six ounces. Now here's a fun fact that'll impress your friends. You can actually live without your spleen. Why? Because your other organs would step up. Really? Then why am I lugging this stupid spleen around if I don't need it? Well, it's definitely better to have one because it stores blood and helps fight serious infections. But its main job is to act like a filter for your blood. Healthy blood cells flow through the spleen no problem, bada bing, bada boom. But the damaged and dead cells get caught in a series of narrow passageways and then get broken down. So essentially, the spleen's kind of like a badass bouncer for your blood. Yeah, it kind of is. And it also filters out bacteria and viruses, creating white blood cells to help fight infection. So a spleen cleans up your blood, produces the essentials to battle infection, and keeps some blood in storage for you. Congratulations, you're now a certified spleenologist. So like I said earlier, Mercury can represent the afterlife when it's in the earth, but that's just another symbol for the spleen because the spleen is where the red blood cells come to rest. And so to put it differently, we put, we plant seeds in the earth, right? We bury our dead in the earth. So in other words, the spleen is that in the body. It's like the body's graveyard, but it redistributes the nutrients as sits. So the spleen is really related to our overall mental health, spiritual health, and physical health. So it's a very important thing, but a lot of people don't really talk about it. So the spleen is closely related to the center of man, which is the yod, which is the hand of God, which is the foundation of all other letters in the Hebrew combination. So all Hebrew letters have a form or instance of the yod just in different ways. So the yod is the building blocks to language. Understand that the word is God. That's one of the major things, but understanding how to formulate your words in different spells and incant incantations could really make or break your magic. But we just tend to not understand that process. So in deeply understanding this process, you got to tap into a level of wisdom and discernment. 
within us we have the spleen that's already doing it so we can tap into that wisdom and we can relate it into our external world the purity that represents the virgo archetype is wisdom of the body so in other words like i said earlier the sperm is not controlled by man's mind the sperm has a mind of its own and because it has a mind of its own life can continue so therefore encapsulates the inner wisdom of this archetype that we can tap into our human body to understand that we're much smarter than we give ourselves credit to in basic terms the hermit is sperm and male fertility but it needs the goddess of virgo to manifest sperm within itself is just nothing it's a seed but when you plant it into the into the goddess it grows into something and now this could be a baby this could be ideas businesses so forth and so on how we connect this to the spleen the spleen transports the nutrients required for sperm production so in other words this archetype once again represents the hidden wisdom and discernment within our body has a way of making decisions for us and we don't realize it. We think we're in control, but in understanding astrology, understanding this hidden wisdom is more of the wisdom of the body that all of us can tap into to really help us with our external world. But the problem is we're focused on the external world and disregarding the inner world because it's so advanced. Sperm, fertility, the spleen, intestines are a result of our unconscious process that are vital to living a healthy, happy, life no more melancholy ladies and gentlemen to finish up the spleen governs the transportation and transformation of what we consume into energy that builds and protects the blood this is alchemy whatever we eat has to be broken down and transferred into energy so be mindful of what you eat and that connects to the previous lesson that we was talking about in cancer uh the digestive tract and then combining it with the spleen then we understand like man what i eat is really important to my overall spiritual development um because it gets into a point of knowing how to purify the blood and that's what the spleen does so why is it important to purify the blood because the blood holds our entire consciousness it holds our entire blueprint to our past lives ancestors so forth and so on so if we're just unmindful of our blood flow and unmindful of our inner inner dialogue then we have passed crazy at this point it's time to purify your blood and get in contact with yourself google how to purify your blood with supplements what what are the things to do to purify your blood if you feeling a little off you might look at the external world like being a problem but the gist of these conversations is that it's not the external world it is your internal world that need to be adjusted and the realization comes from the earth element and the earth element is connected to the archetypal figure of the mother and the mother is our first sense of nourishment our first source of nourishment before we was conscious before we thought we was you know magic magicians witches and all of these particular things we were inundated by the earth element and that figure is our mother so the love of the mother instills in us the ability to care for or mother ourselves so within us we have a motherly energy that cares for us and we can't necessarily care for it but we can by being aware and doing things so the spleen represents that earth element within us earth is associated with harvest time so the promise of harvest is the culmination of all what we had was once a seed has now come into fruition and that's where you get the wheat from that is symbolized with virgo because that wheat is the actual growth from that seed okay when we speak of treating the spirit we must remember that the spirit itself is pure consciousness is indivisible it cannot be compromised or corrupted composed of nothing but itself it has no parts to treat to balance or imbalance however our perception of spirit can indeed be compromised so when you look inside of yourself and you're alive you're kicking you're moving you look inside yourself you see a perfect system when you look outside of yourself you see an imperfect system so that imperfect system could really throw off your perception of your perfection but when you are in a meditative mode you're looking within balancing yourself out activating your glands 
mastering your hormones then your external world will change but if you're trying to change the outside without changing the inside your external world will change but you will not appreciate it because you're bringing yourself with you okay and if you if you understand about yourself it has to be a matter of perception to conclude we cannot treat this spirit we must treat our perception of this spirit and this requires the purification that the spleen provides so tapping into to this inner wisdom is all you need to do people always ask well how do i do this how do i raise the kundalini can you tell me about this can you tell me about that yes and no and the most that i'm gonna tell you is to how to get in tune with yourself once you activate this archetype within you are activating your love marriage balance fairness beauty and trust within and this is the archetype of the libra adjustment and through understanding the kidneys we understand the marriage within as well as the marriage without, as above, so below. The word archetype is a Greek word, archetupon, which means first molded. Carl Jung claimed that a fixed number of models that we all share without having been taught. And he reasoned that these archetypes are inner clues as to how we can grow into self-realization. The constellation Libra is Latin for scales or balance and is the seventh astrological sign. Libra has a cardinal error mode of expression. In other words, it represents our mental biases that we hold. Another way of saying this is justice or fairness because justice and fairness are simply mental biases manifested. It does not mean that it is right or wrong. It is just what we simply believe. And Libra is ruled by Venus. So this is the mental side of beauty in love once again beauty is in the eye of the beholder it does not mean that it is right or wrong or right and exact so when it references beauty it is a mental bias that we must hold if we view ourselves as beautiful or our partners as beautiful beauty cannot be judged objectively for what one person finds beautiful or admirable may not appeal to another another way that we describe or understand the energy of libra in this archetype is through the goddess Mayat, the goddess of truth, justice, and balance. From Mayat, we learn the concept of inner balance, which comes the hallmark of Libra. In understanding this archetype, we'll look at the tarot card, the adjustment, and the Thoth tarot deck, or justice in the Rider Waite. The adjustment tarot card stands for uncompromising honesty and objectivity, the realization of cause and effect in the background and consequences. Above all, the adjustment is a symbol for balance of contrast and complement in one another. Also, adjustment, the tarot card is ruled by Libra, which emphasizes the energy of this card being all about balance and equilibrium, karmic cause and effect, and bringing a situation into balance, weighing the pros and cons. Adjustment and Libra are associated with the Hebrew letter Lamed. And to explain, Lamed means to learn and to teach. And according to Kabbalah, these are one and the same. In other words, one has to learn and teach in equal measure to achieve balance. One cannot simply learn everything and not teach it to others because how would you learn things if somebody didn't think to teach you? One has to learn and teach in equal measure and this is the hebrew letter behind adjustment in libra the seventh house correlates to the sign of libra which represents our primal balance and our ability to connect with others in close ways as a result human beings in relationship achieve balance when we learn and teach one another in equal measure and this could be close relationships personal relationships or business relationships you achieve balance when you learn and teach. And now to understand this in the human body, we go to the archetype and we study the archetype in the ways of the kidneys. You have two kidneys found in the lower middle of the back above the waist, one on each side of the spine. Each kidney is about the size of your fist and weighs about a quarter of a pound. Blood travels to your kidneys through blood vessels called the renal arteries and away from the kidneys through the renal veins. Urine is made in the kidneys and flows through tubes called the ureters to the bladder where it is stored. When you urinate, the urine empties from the bladder through the urethra 
and then passes out of the body. The entire system is called the urinary tract. Because Libra rules the kidneys, okay? The kidneys have a kind of a sixth sense in that they filter the blood. They instinctively know when the body is out of balance and when it is, the kidneys correct it. So in our bodies, there is a form of balancing. There is a form of understanding our ancestral life and our past life and the modality to purify the blood. And these are the records of who we are and where we come from. We would not know this if it wasn't for the kidneys. So within that sense, the kidneys activate our genetic potential. But if we're stuck in our failures, if we're stuck in our disappointments, these actually weaken the kidneys. And so we're not able to tap into our genetic birthright. Consequently, when we're led by our fears, this slows our thought process. Let's remember that Libra rules the mind, Libra rules the air, and how we view and understand our life is based upon this Libra principle. So if we look at life in a negative sense, then that is going to weaken our kidneys and we're not going to be able to tap into our genetic potential. And as a result, fear leads to isolation and indifference, which crystallizes the kidneys and throws our whole entire life out of balance. So to get the love that we need without, we have to establish the love that we need within. And this is found in the Libra adjustment archetype. When we learn and teach at equal measure, we establish balance and we must establish that balance within. When we learn about our body and teach about our body in equal measure, we are activating our energy. And this archetype is activated when one has a mental approach to love that incites our equal amount of learning and teaching and balancing. Consequently, when we balance ourselves at an intimate level, we are enabling a commitment to commit, whether that commitment is to our body, to our partner, to our business, so forth and so on. And another word for this is marriage. In harmony between a man and his wife is unpardonable, no matter what may be the cause. It is unpardonable because it may destroy a man's chances of success, even though he has every attribute necessary for success. Today we're talking about the archetype of Scorpio and death and understanding this archetype in its deepest forms. We'll deal with the constellation, we'll deal with the tarot card, then we'll put them together and connect this energy to our human body. So like I said earlier, the first thing that we're going to start with is the constellation of Scorpio, which is Latin for scorpion. It is the eighth astrological sign. It is also the ruler of the eighth house. Also, Scorpio has a fixed water mode of expression. So fixed just simply means set. Water just means our emotions. So Scorpio is our set emotions and our set emotions are not on the surface. The, th the emotions that we're comfortable with, the emotions that we know are not the emotions that we reference when we talk about Scorpio is more of the emotions that are frozen. If one would understand the difference between ice and water ice ice is more static more solidified while water is more fluid but when you reference the set emotions it's still those same emotions but just more stagnant and more set so in order to understand it you need to apply heat or apply understanding to understand your set emotions and a way to understand your set emotions is by Donald Goldman's book, Emotional Intelligence. With all that being said, Scorpio is ruled by Pluto and Mars, which links this constellation to our transformative sexual energy. Pluto was Greek for wealth and how they came to that understanding. There was a small group of people who understood the mineral wealth of the earth. So they would gather up all of the gold, they would gather up all of the diamonds and they would hold large amounts of wealth so these were understood as the plutocracy, a small group of people who understood their wealth. On a personal sense, when we understand our set emotions or our frozen emotions, we melt those emotions and they become more fluid and more understandable. Then we're more into our internal wealth. When you think about emotional intelligence, it is the intelligence of leaders to understand first your emotions and then the emotions of people that you work with. So that's a level of the Pluto energy. 
Secondly, we have Mars, which represents our libido, competitiveness, our drive, animal instincts, our passions. It's just our aggressive action that we all have. But wherever it appears in your chart, you can learn about your engine. You can learn about what makes you go. So once you put Mars and Pluto together, you have the energy of Scorpio. Moving forward, we have the Death Tarot card, which is assigned to the sign of Scorpio and is associated with sexuality and death. So one would be like, what does sex and death have to do with each other, hood mystic? And I would be like, well, ancient cultures did not view death the same way that we view death. Ancient cultures viewed death as the form of reincarnation. When one soul leaves, another one soul enters and then that soul comes back into life. So if we understand the process of reincarnation, then how do those souls come into being? Well, the, the way that human beings come into being is through the modality of sex. So you're not just having a child, you're having an ancestor. And so if you have that idea, then you understand the energy of Scorpio. Moving forward, Noon is the Hebrew letter that ties Scorpio to the Death Tarot card. And Noon represents the fish. Noon also represents the union between male and female. So in other words, Noon is our sexual glands and the fish represent the sperm and the ovum. And to summarize all of this, every living thing came out of the waters of sex. But for that sexual act to create, there had to be a combination of Noon. There had to be sperm and ovum or sperm and the womb and the egg cells. And this is why we're all here. So putting these things together, understanding both of these energies as one, the key characteristics of this archetype are found in how we individuate our spiritual self through sex and death, because individuation is the mode of distinguishing yourself from others and realizing your distinct destiny. And this is the process. So this process is done by raising up your sexual energy, because if you do not raise up your sexual energy, you will be caught in the set emotion of Scorpio and just unconscious sexual reproduction. But to step out of that and to get into a more evolved sense of sex and death and reincarnation and rebirth, you bring your energy to life. And so you can't bring your old self into your new self. So the idea is to bring death to your old self to allow this new self to raise up. And this is all tied into sexual energy and sexual energy is how you liberate yourself or keep yourself as a slave. So moving on with this archetype, there is an expression called the little death, which means a brief loss or weakening of consciousness. And in modern usage, it refers specifically to the sensation of, of post orgasm as likened to death. And it can refer to the spiritual release that comes with orgasm to a short period of melancholy or transcendence as a result of the expenditure of this life force. So another name for this life force energy is Qing and Qing is our sexual energy that is produced and stored in the testicles and ovaries. Now the testicles and ovaries is the reproductive system. And this is the same area that Scorpio rules over and the testicles and ovaries are unique in that when you lose the physical organs, you cannot create the Qing. So it's very special energy that requires your physical organs for its production. So to summarize this sperm and eggs are overflowing with Qing. It is a substance that can recreate life and fully potent creative energy. You don't have to recreate life. You can recreate dreams, desires, all of these things, but it's mainly in raising your sexual energy and not keeping your sexual energy based. Our bodies are basically factories for the production of this vital power. So how you use this power is completely up to you. And this is why there is so much porn, so much sexual inundation on TV is because they want you to use your sexual energy on its lowest form possible. They do not want you to raise your energy up because now you have to deal with the level of your godhood. And once you deal with this level of your godhood, there is nothing that can stop you because as we know, this world is an illusion. So in order to play with the illusion, you have to raise your sexual energy up. Understanding a Scorpio archetype, 
this is a major breakthrough this is a major gateway so as we discuss these next constellations understand that you have to have your energy raised and complete to even understand the energy of sagittarius aquarius capricorn and pisces we'll be discussing the archetype of sagittarius the art of alchemy tarot card or temperis and connecting this to the sciatic nerve which is the hip and thigh bone and show the actual root of emotional pain which is astral pain and how that actually leads to physical pain so we can actually alleviate that physical pain alleviate that emotional pain and come to self-realization through understanding archetypes which are the hidden more innate abilities talents that we have that are brought to the surface through studying occult knowledge the constellation sagittarius is latin for archer and it pertains to arrows it is the ninth astrological sign it rules the ninth house sagittarius is a mutable fire mode of expression so in other words sagittarius represents our ability to alternate our drives and passions a, an easier way of understanding sagittarius is shoot for the stars or follow your dreams these are sagittarian themes and sagittarian phrases sagittarius rules the sciatic nerve located in the hip so when they say sagittarius rules the hip they are referencing the actual sciatic nerve located in the hip this sciatic nerve is likened to the human body's arrow so the nerve is the arrow and then there's a sciatic foramen that is the bow for which the arrow goes through and so if you understand the internal decoding then you understand the external decoding because as above so below as within so without the sciatic nerve has to literally pass from the pelvis through the sciatic foramen as an arrow passes through a bow and so let's just check out a quick video to explain a little more of what i was talking about So yeah, man, Sagittarius has rulership over one of the largest peripheral nerves in our body. The sciatic nerve could be as big as your thumb. This is a large nerve and it controls a large portion of our movement. It, it controls a large portion of our expansion. So this is why Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter, which links this constellation to our faith, our positivism, our optimism, it is our movement, our expansion moving forward, as opposed to Saturn, which we'll talk about in Capricorn, which deals with contraction. And so this aspiration is more of connecting to our higher self, our vital bodies, our astral bodies, and our mental bodies, and actually understanding the, the modality and how to utilize the astral world and the mental body and things of that nature. And the way that we get to this point is through the art of alchemy tarot card the art of alchemy tarot card is traditionally titled temperance it usually depicts an angel pouring liquid between blue and red vases however in the crowley deck the deck is retitled art which is short for the art of alchemy and if you look at the art card she is clearly doing a form of alchemy she is taking the good with the bad the fire with the water and putting it in a pot mixing it up and coming up with something new this is the art 
of alchemy it is taking your positive situations and your negative situations to create a now situation the actual hebrew letter that supports sagittarius as well as the art of alchemy card is the hebrew letter semek meaning prop or crutch so the letter semek created the sign sagittarius what is not commonly known is that the semek is based on the, the dead pillar hieroglyph and additionally the dejed pillar represents our lumbar region and this is where the sciatic nerve is formed if you reference that video that we just watched it comes from the lumbar region of the spine so this represents the root of your chakra system this represents your root movement when they speak to grounding this is what your sciatic nerve does it grounds yourself it grounds your body to the world so a powerful symbol if you understand what is actually being said in the more physical sense but also in the deeper spiritual esoteric sense so if we look at this we have the dejed pillar and the dejed pillar is the base of the spine the upper region of the spine as you well know is found in the ankh so understanding in the hieroglyphs that they were just detailing the human body and how to raise kundalini and how to raise your spiritual energy is a miraculous discovery uh, that i don't think many people talk about and then we can see the evolution of the hebrew letter semek where it looks exactly like the Dejed pillar and then it eventually changes into a Ouroboros which represents a snake eating its own tail but we'll get into more about that a little later so let's explore Sagittarius in the art of alchemy archetype so our ability to explore right because we have our legs our ability to love knowledge be free think deeply find the truth teach others jupiter represents the guru the inner guru but then our actual birthright with our ability to teach others all that we have learned in doing the knowledge ourselves it doesn't make sense to gain all of this knowledge and hold it for ourselves there has to be a understanding which we talked about in previous videos of la med which means i learn and teach at equal measure within my relationship so this continues those values because this is a twin energy as well if this archetype lies dormant then the pain manifests strictly in the sciatic nerve and one would say how would you say something like that well a lot of people suffer from sciatica and this is a common common condition and what that says to me is that a lot of people still have emotional pain that they're not actually dealing with and addressing and once it gets to the point of physical pain then you know the emotional pain has somewhat crystallized and now it's alerting you to really deal with it at this point so as we said earlier sagittarius rules the sciatic nerve the largest nerve in the body most nerves are very thread-like in appearance, but the sciatic nerve is more accurately visualized as a thick, smooth, gray rope, often approaching an inch in diameter. So let's deal with some metaphors for the sciatic nerve. The metaphor of the sciatic nerve is being frozen with fear around manifestation. When you have struggles with time and money and fear around survival, these are significant contributors. A person is usually overburdened and feels like they're carrying the weight of the world on their back and they have nobody to help carry the load or support them. And this is a metaphor for sciatica. If you feel this way, this could be a contributor to the pain that's going in your hip, lower legs, knees, lower legs, and um feet as well because the nerve shoots down all the way to your feet another metaphor for sciatica is a dog chasing its tail and not sure which way to go and so when we have these sort of things in our lives where we don't know what we're doing but we're waking up and we're doing things but we have these real ultimate questions of simply not knowing this is a dog chasing its tail this ties into some this ties into the Ouroboros. This ties into society at large and the ability to not go in that circle, but then find a direction to go and have a purpose, waking up and doing things that you really want to do. And the Semek 
relates directly to the Ouroboros, which is that serpent biting its own tail as well. So this is a metaphor for sciatica and also a metaphor for the Ouroboros. So this is another way that we connect the sciatic nerve to Sagittarius, to Semek, and also to the art of alchemy. And this is how we deal with the esoterics. We take it straight to the human body and deal with our human body. How do you feel within? then you have a corresponding remedy, whether it's through constellations, whether it's through herbs, whether it's through particular plant life, you know, the list goes on and on by how many different ways that this energy can particularly correspond in a way that you can heal yourself. One of the most important things you can do to heal yourself is sleep. So another understanding of Semek in the Ouroboros is vital energy because vital energy animates the physical body. The physical body is not a machine within itself. It is supplied by vital energy that takes place when you're asleep. So let's just think about this. When we go to sleep, we're exhausted. When we generally wake up, we wake up refreshed because what is happening? We are being vitalized by a particular energy. Our vital body is absorbing lunar energy surrounding us and sending it to our chakras, aka glands in the body that is waking up every day. So when you reference activating the chakras, you're actually referencing activating something within you or activating an actual purpose because this energy is sent directly through the spine. So when we reference the spine, we're not referencing some abstract energy. We're referencing the sciatic nerves because it is formed and founded in the base of the spine. So that energy goes directly to your spine and moves through your legs. So what you decide to do and move and expand and express yourself is brought to you via the dream. So this is why Sagittarius rules dreams. So this is why another word for saying Sagittarius is follow your dreams. This is why another word for Sagittarius is shoot for the stars because this represents a nighttime energy that is being realized in our actual life. However, when people suffer from sciatica, they tend to suffer from a lack of sleep. This is one of the main things like a person might not experience sciatica until they actually lay down and go to sleep. And this sleep is irritability and is stress and is anxiety and depression. So why do they ancients call this energy a Ouroboros? Because once you get into this cycle where you're not sleeping, where you're stressed out, where you're anxious, where you're depressed, you are a dog chasing his tail. You are a snake biting its own tail. There is no way to get out of that cycle. And this sciatic pain is keeping you awake at night and preventing you from tapping into this energy that can actually heal you. Finally, dealing with emotional pain and how it leads to physical pain. If you suffer from physical pain, it is not the physical pain within itself. The physical pain is a symptom. However, the source of that physical pain is emotional pain, is actual things that you need to do, places that you need to go, ways that you need to expand that you're just not doing. And for that, you experience particular physical pain. It's very interesting when you're in places and situations where you're exuding this purpose that you don't feel physical pain. You, even if you have really chronic physical pain when you are in your purpose when you're in your glory your mind isn't there so this is really signifying that emotions directly tie into physical pain and the sciatic nerve provides the connection to the nervous system for the whole skin of the leg and the muscles of the back of the thigh and those of the leg and the foot so this is why emotional pain is the foundation for many physical ailments, including sciatica. And if I didn't mention this before, 3 million US cases per year. So this is very common in people. So physical pain is very common in people, which leads me to say that emotional pain is beyond common. And emotional pain is the thing that's not being treated. They give you medicine for the physical pain, but what are they giving you for the emotional pain, the source or the root of the pain that you experience? So. This is all energy that ties into Sagittarius because all information comes from the cosmos, lunar energy. When you sleep, you wake up to new information, okay? So 
dealing with this further, stress and pain. A number of studies have indicated stress can constrict muscles and nerves, causing physical pain. The physical discomfort is often a signal to the brain that emotional traumas need to be resolved to reduce tension and other issues affected the nervous system. Here I've been showing a chart that's showing you the different ways that pain conflicts with emotion. So if you're struggling with stress, emotional burden, lack of emotional support, emotional burden. So for me personally, I've been feeling a lot of stress in my shoulders and nowhere else particularly, but mainly in my shoulders. So emotional burden or feeling overwhelmed is just the energy that I've been dealing with. But see, if I'm just dealing with the shoulder energy, I'm just going to the chiropractor, getting my neck snapped or going to the doctor and taking medicine. But maybe I'm relieving my pain. But the source of my pain, the emotional burden is not being resolved. So therefore, you can understand the snake going in a circle or the dog biting his own tail. So this is all connected to Sagittarius. So here are some quick tips to reduce emotional pain. I feel like this video is slightly longer based upon the resonance and the, the just the, the subject matter is very relatable, it seems as though. Nerves have to do with communication and sensitivity. Sciatica implies that there are emotional issues affecting the back and legs and that these are deep and inner issues. These may be issues to do with being able to stand up for yourself Perhaps something is happening that you cannot take anymore and it is making you go into a different direction. Or perhaps you desperately need more support and cannot cope with everything on your own any longer. So here are some tips to reduce that. Learn how to acknowledge the deeper unknown issues and stand up for yourself. More importantly, do not let things linger on without addressing it based on the unbearable pain that can manifest from it. Nobody wants to suffer from physical pain, but the solution is to deal with that emotional pain nipping in the butt. And if you are in that loop, understand that you have to take that giant leap outside of that loop and deal with the inner emotional pain first and foremost. It may be sounding like the most difficult thing to do, but it's actually the most easiest thing you can do because it simply is writing some things down, talking to yourself and becoming real about who you are and where you want to be. Everything grows and everything expands if everything's alive. And if you are not doing that, you are dying. So let's get to some expansion. Let's get to some Sagittarius, some Jupiterian energy. This is video 10 out of 12 in the astrology and archetype series. In this video, we'll be discussing the archetypes, which are the innate abilities humans have that through studying esoteric sciences and spiritual development, we bring those innate abilities into self-realization. This astrology archetype that we're talking about today is Capricorn and the devil. Now, first and foremost, the constellation Capricorn is Latin for a horn goat or goat horn or having horns like a goat and is the 10th astrological sign. Additionally, Capricorn has a cardinal earth mode, which focuses on the physicality, practicality, stability and seriousness of life. Furthermore, this is the sign and the origin of all Earth's characteristics. Capricorn is ruled by the planet Saturn, and at its lowest form, this represents earthly existence. However, at its highest form, it represents transfiguration or rebirth and achieving the ultimate success. Saturn, Capricorn, is linked to our skin, teeth, bones, and the foundation to our overall health and wellness. So in other words, Saturn rules our fascia. And this is beneath the skin that attaches, stabilizes, and closes and separates muscles from other internal organs. The fascia energy system is the least most understood energy system and quite possibly the most important for there is no body part, not one single cell that isn't connected to fascia. So as a result, 
Capricorn and Saturn represents our basic protective mechanism and boundary against the outside world. Now, the Devil Tarot card is associated with Capricorn, Saturn, and the Hebrew letter Ayin. Altogether, this energy represents tunnel vision and the boundaries that allow you to focus on your goal and looking out for your best interests. And additionally, this relates to your career, ambitions, and protection of yourself. To connect Ayin to Capricorn, one must think of the eye and the goat's horn being synonymous with the pineal gland. And this eye in most adults is calcified, which means bone-like in structure. In the 1990s, Jennifer Luke discovered that fluoride accumulates to strikingly high levels in the pineal gland. In fact, the calcified parts of pineal glands contain the highest fluoride concentrations in the body, even higher than bones and teeth. The pineal gland, it attracts fluoride and becomes even harder than our skeleton. So when you reference Capricorn ruling over bones, it is speaking about the calcified pineal gland more than it is talking about your skeletal system and we'll explain why a little later. So in understanding this Capricorn and devil archetype and centering in our pineal gland and what this actually means, this means our ability to know, execute, maintain, and continue to do what's best for us on an internal level and on an external level. And on the internal level, this is found in activating this archetype. Additionally, activating this archetype allows your body to protect you and align you with your highest success almost automatically. However, this requires an internal change to experience an external difference. And to make this a little bit more simple, when you activate your third eye, this releases the wonder hormone melatonin. And from this point, your fascia energy system is activated and it frees you from the stuck and hard vibrations of negative patterns that you've created by living with a calcified pineal gland. When our pineal gland is calcified, our fascia energy system is contracted. And this is one of the major energies of Saturn, the energy of contraction. And this is found in a calcified pineal gland. So our perception then gets confused. And so we naturally retreat and live in a space of fear. But if we are ignorant of our fascia energy system, we have no remedy. And consequently, we outsource our frustration on an imaginary devil because we do not know how to overcome our problems. We do not know how to go within and activate our pineal gland. This archetype is about activating your inner elder and personal guide, also known as the pineal gland or Horus. When this gland is activated, protection, success, and fame awaits us. Horus is another word for saying hero, and this is activating your inner hero or inner heroine. Furthermore, this archetype implies that we can accomplish much if we are focused on our spiritual and physical life, which in turn balances our inner hormones and emotional inner life. Finally, this archetype when activated leads us to true success and purpose. This has been talked about in many Egyptian hieroglyphs and referencing Horus and Set in the battle between good and evil, which is found within. When they say that Osiris was put into a casket and sent off to sea, they are talking about calcified pineal gland. And when Isis recovers all the missing pieces and births Horus, this is talking about the rebirth of that calcified pineal gland. Once you rediscover how to take over your life and master your inner life through the balancing of your hormones. So the idea is to meditate upon your pineal gland, bring your focus and tension and mind to the center of your forehead and activate that energy and feel it throb and pulsate in the middle of your forehead. You could do this throughout the day. Just be mindful. Do not be ignorant of your Horus within, of your Savior within, 
as we go into this spiritual esoteric time. Be sure to visit this site to get the full transcript for this video. In this video, we are attempting to connect the constellation Aquarius with the star tarot card with the purpose of activating the archetype of the circulatory system. What will be shown is how concentrating on your heart, you increase your electromagnetic field. And when you increase your electromagnetic field, you are activating your psychic abilities, thus entering you fully into the Aquarian age. First, let's deal with the definition of archetypes, which is from the Greek word archetupon, which means the first molded. Later, the psychologist Carl Jung claimed that there is a fixed number of molds that we all share without having been taught them at all. And therefore, he reasoned that these archetypes are inner clues as how we can grow into self-realization. We're dealing with the constellation of Aquarius, which is Latin for water carrier or cup carrier. And this is the 11th sign of the zodiac. Furthermore, Aquarius has a fixed air mode, which represents a constant flowing of intuition, which deals with the human body. When we're alive, we have a constant flow of blood. So as a result of this constant intuition and constant blood flow, man is free from karma and is able to serve without being held back for any reason. So for this reason, Saturn and Uranus rule Aquarius as one. Saturn is more of a force. Uranus is more of a freeing energy. So we're forced to free ourselves once we enter into the Aquarian age or activate the Aquarius archetype within. Aquarius rules the circulatory system, breath and eyesight. Structurally, it rules the bones of the lower limbs like the ankles. The translation of Aquarius is the water carrier, and this is found in the circulatory system where blood is literally carried away and towards the heart through veins and arteries. Furthermore, this circulatory system is the main transport system of the body, and Aquarius symbolizes the system within. Now let's remember, as above so below. And what exemplifies the principle of as above, so below is the star tarot card, which depicts the goddess Nuit, who is an Egyptian mythology, a goddess of the sky, and is personified as a human being in this tarot card. She is pouring out the waters of love and gifts of spirit. So therefore, this card signifies the process of constant renewal of life and also the possibilities of mere existence, much like the circulatory system within. In the star, in the star card, there is a woman, Nuit, that is receiving water, and she is also giving water. Traditionally, she has one foot on land and the other foot on water, thus bridging the gap between the formless water and the form earth. And so the formless is the blood and the form is our human bodies. Furthermore, this card represents our individuality, uniqueness, however, our ability to care about others simultaneously. And to this end, we are truly fulfilled and inspired by the reminder to follow our dreams daily. And this is what the star tarot card signifies. The star card in Aquarius is associated with the Hebrew letter, hey, which means window. So for instance, a window allows light to shine through. As humans, we are able to channel divine light within, and then outwardly, we can send that energy out, just like a window, and that's what this Hebrew letter is speaking to. Understanding Aquarius and the star archetype. We have the ability within to use our genius to care for others, invent solutions for humanity, rebel against the status quo, and teach that new information. All of this is found in the archetype of Aquarius in the star. And specifically, activating this archetype enables us to engage with our electromagnetic field. Electromagnetic field is a classical energy that is produced by moving electrical charges. 
Now the electrical charges that we're referencing is the electrical charge of the heart. The heart is the most powerful source of electromagnetic energy within the human body, producing the largest rhythmic electromagnetic field of any of the body's organs. Furthermore, the heart's electrical field is about 60 times greater in amplitude than the electrical activity generated by the brain. Thus, the circulatory system is a network consisting of blood, blood vessels, and the heart. This network supplies tissues in the bodies with oxygen and other nutrients, it transports hormones, and also removes unnecessary waste products from our body. The heart is made of specialized cardiac muscle tissue that allows it to act as a pump within the circulatory system. So to tie this all into the Aquarius and star archetype, it is very important to our well-being and existence to understand conscious awareness. When we think, we are consciously aware of our thoughts, but that is not the reality of who we are. It is our mere awareness. We could be aware of our heart pumping, and that could be a form of thought. But sometimes we just simply think that our thoughts are something that we should be aware of, but that is not always the case. So it is therefore largely responsible for the changes that are being affected in our planetary lives in nature. Because it's an air sign, its influence is all pervasive and penetrating throughout all forms of life. And this energy is the energy of Aquarius. This energy is the energy of the star. Wherever you go, there you are. You are taking your body with you wherever you go. At nighttime, wherever you are, when you look up into the sky, you can see those stars. So this represents a ubiquitous energy that we just simply need to be aware of to increase our electromagnetic field. In summary, this archetype suggests that the inner waves and the fluidity of the circulatory system combined with the invisible forces of nature within you aid you in this external world but you just have to be mindful of this invisible force the mere fact is that it's invisible means that you can't see it but you can definitely think on it you can bring your awareness towards it so the quick solution that i have for activating this archetype is to meditate on your bloodstream and your beating heart in order to receive 60 times more wisdom than meditating or thinking about the thoughts that come for your brain. And if you're able to focus in on your heart, you are entering into the Aquarian age. On behalf of all the Aquarians out there, I just want to welcome you. I'm here to discuss this video, which will be outlining the Pisces and the Moon tarot card, as well as the archetype it forms, which is the lymphatic system. It also addresses our fight and flight response and how we balance that energy as well. So without further ado, let's first talk about archetypes. Now, archetypes is a Greek word, archetypon, which means first molded. Carl Jung claimed that there are fixed numbers of models that we all share without having been taught them. So he reasoned that these archetypes are actually inner clues as to how we can grow into self-realization. So when we deal with astrology, when we deal with Tarot, we're actually dealing with the system of how our inner body works. And once we get in tune with our inner body, we can take control of our external world. So let's begin dealing with Pisces. Pisces is Latin for the word fish and it is the 12th and final constellation in classical astrology. Additionally, Pisces is a mutable water sign, which is focused on being adaptable and flexible with your emotions. So in other words, Pisces represents your inner connection with everyone and everything based on the ubiquitous electromagnetic field, which we all share from animals to humans to plants and all things in between. Pisces rules over the entire lymph gland system. This is the body's primary means of detoxification and plays a key role in our human and spiritual potential. Additionally, lymph is a clear to white fluid made of white blood cells, lymphocytes, which are cells that attack bacteria in the blood. So the word rasa means lymph or juice, which implies that the lymph 
is our longevity juice. In other words, Pisces is a water sign represents that lymphatic fluid that detoxifies our body and keeps us alive and present. The moon tarot card represents illusion, deception, and dealing with the more challenging aspects of life. The reason for this is because it represents the unknown fear and the things that we do not really want to face. Pisces is associated with the moon tarot card. For this reason, this card deals with the subconscious, our emotions, intuition, and the arts. Pisces is ruled by Neptune, the god of waters. In Egyptian mythology, this energy is personified as Sobek. In other words, the moon Pisces archetype references your emotional brain, aka your reptilian brain, and its fight or flight response based on the external world. The Hebrew letter Kof connects Pisces and the moon to Rokar. Additionally, Kof means the back of the head and is related to the cerebellum of the brain, which amongst other things is concerned with regulating pleasure and fear responses. Additionally, the lymph system allows for the drainage of cerebrospinal fluid to reduce disease and as well as cancer. Furthermore, when there is no proper drainage and detoxification, disease takes place in our body. So, in understanding this Pisces and Moon archetype, we are activating our inner mystic, our cosmic poet, our lucid dreamer, our constant visionary, our hidden artist, and as well as tap into latent abilities. So specifically, you are activating the shadow of your visible circulatory system and electromagnetic field. And when we reference the shadow, we're just simply referencing the root to our existence, which is found in the lymphatic system. If our blood was never detoxified, if the diseases were never purged out of our body, we would cease to exist. One of the most misunderstood bodily systems is the lymphatic system. And this is mainly because we are focused on accumulating and hoarding while the lymph system purges and detoxifies the body. The lymph vessels are located as network throughout all tissues in the body. Lymph vessels assist the circulatory system and all the cells of the body by removing waste, germs and excess water from the tissue fluid. Additionally, the lymph fluid is the most refined substance in the body that resembles consciousness itself. Also, this fluid resides in the heart. It maintains our body and also supports the spiritual process. Moving on. The fight or flight response, also known as the acute stress response, refers to a psychological reaction that occurs in the presence of something that is terrifying, either mentally or physically. The response is triggered by the release of hormones that prepare your body to either stay or deal with the threat to run to safety. While the fight or flight response happens automatically, that does not mean that is always accurate. Sometimes we respond in this way when there is no real threat. So in understanding the body's natural fight or flight response is one way to help cope with such situations. When you notice that you are becoming tense, you can start looking for ways to calm down and relax your body. Sobek is associated with the reptilian brain. This is the primitive nonverbal part of the brain that ensures our survival at the level of stimulus and response. The reptilian brain holds the most ancient evolutionary patterns from which we have evolved. Sobek is also another way of saying Neptune, the planet that rules over Pisces. So in conclusion, to create a balance in our inner lives, we must assign emotions to our knowledge. When we read things, it is simple to have this information, but if it doesn't change our emotional field, then it won't change our lives. So read things, pay attention to things that uplift your emotions. That way you are balancing out your fight or flight response system and then also balancing out your hormones. Be mindful when you are stressed and there is no imminent danger. Always seek to relax and calm yourself in stressful situations because we also have to remember that our hormones do so much for us and this is beyond our conscious understanding. The way that we assist our body is to move into states of mind that promote peace, calmness, and tranquility and allow our body to do its thing. Now, 
that has been my presentation on Pisces. And hopefully you've had a chance to read through all of these astrological archetypes. If you need more information from me, please email me at hoodmystic at gmail.com if you have any questions. Also, be sure to check out the transcripts to this video and all of my videos on hoodmystic.com. It's one thing to listen, but it's also another thing to read, click the links, and do your own personal research so you can activate these archetypes within yourself. Be sure to check out my book, Astrology Explained, Manipulating the Matrix, as well as How to Read Natal Charts Easily and Effectively. All of these books are available in Kindle as well as paperback, and they'll be available in the links in the description. If you need anything else additional, you know how to reach me, but I'll catch you on the flip side, family. Peace.